want to welcome you to our time of worship today. And uh, for those who are watching online, our, our service is one week behind. But for those who are gathered here this morning, no doubt you'll have seen last night um, those terrible scenes of destruction and fighting in Israel. And so in a little while, we're going to be praying. And remember that particularly in prayer. But the psalmist reminds us that our God is a refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. And we do pray that in the midst of this terrible struggle in Israel, that people would find refuge in God and in Jesus and the Savior he provided to be our refuge. And so through him alone, we find the ultimate peace that this world needs. But our first hymn we're going to sing is one that we're reminded of the one who is above all things, the one who possesses all power, who possesses all authority, splendor, and dignity the one through whom one day the world will one day bow before him. Jesus is Lord, the one who suffered for our sakes, who offers the sure promise of life eternal to all who trust in him. And so let's sing, Name of All Majesty. We'll stand as we sing this together, please. Let's pray together, remembering particularly this situation in Israel at the moment. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we want to thank you, Lord, for the reminder in this hymn that there is a higher authority that is over this world. Lord, we know that you see all things. We know, Lord, that you're aware of hearts breaking today. And Lord, those even maybe in our own country, Lord, even anxious by what they've seen in their TV screens. But Lord, we do pray for those lives who have been affected by this terrible conflict in Israel and Palestine. For those families who have lost loved ones. Father, for those people, Lord, we pray, even those who are just living in fear and anxiety, even over what might come next. Father, we pray for those whose loved ones have even been snatched as well. Those who have been taken hostage. 
Father, we pray for them in this circumstance. And Lord, in the midst of this situation, we do pray for peace. We do pray, Lord, for our world leaders and governments, even that you will grant them wisdom in their response too. And Lord, we live in a world full of violence and conflict. But Father, we pray that the people in this world would seek the true peace that all need, that peace which is only found in you. Lord, we pray for those in Israel who have have trusted Jesus as their uh, true Messiah and Savior. And Lord, we pray that you will even use them as witnesses, even to others around them. Lord, we know that one day war and conflict will be no more. One day the mightiest kings and nations will one day bow before Jesus. Lord, one day they will bow before him and they will have to confess him as Lord. Father, we do recognize, Lord, your absolute sovereignty. Lord, that none of these things surprise you, Lord, for you have told us in your word that there will be wars and even rumors of wars. And Father, but these things only remind us, Lord, that the time is growing short. Lord, that we know that there will be a time of when Christ will return. A time also, Lord, when there will be a day of judgment. And Lord, you alone know when that is. But so, Lord, we want to thank you for the comfort that you give us in your word of for those here in Christ Jesus, that we know that there will be a new creation and for the assurance as believers that we will have in that day that we will stand in the day of judgment, Lord, that we will be able to stand clothed in Christ's righteousness. And so, Lord, comfort us by that knowledge and help us, Lord, as we seek to proclaim of your word once again today. May your word go forth in your power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to mention um, a few announcements this morning, and please do bear with me because there are, there are a few of them, and mainly the concern the ladies actually today. So, ladies, do pay attention. I uh, have this one. So, um, the the ladies in our church also have been um, very busy in the last little while. Well, you've been busy anyway most of the time for different things, but busy the last little while preparing things for Laura Murray's trip to Lebanon. And Laura's going out to I know, an orphanage there as well. And they've made a total of 70 teddies. And uh, I can verify, because I seen the production line in action in Make and Do last week. I was down at Make and Do last Monday and see some of the last teddies being uh, finished off. So there's a total of uh, 70 teddies. And there's some of the, the collection. So some of the ladies from Make and Do and some other ladies in our church here, I know we're working on those teddies. So uh, Laura wants to pass on her, her thanks to you all. And she passed on her thanks to the one on Facebook. But we'll also thank you as a church also for being involved in that. So thank you for your hard work and for those on the Lebanon team. Uh, but also, there's a number of women's events coming up as well. We mentioned some of these on Tuesday evening, but I just want to bring these to your attention again. Um, so the Irish Women's Convention is taking place. You'll have seen this slide coming up. And if you haven't uh, had your prescription renewed and can't read the fine print, don't worry. I'm going to give you some of the details now. The Irish Women's Convention takes place every year, um, but it's taking place this year on the 14th of October. Now, the in-person event uh, tickets for that have been sold out. But don't fear, because Malayle Baptist have said that they're going to host a live stream. You can actually purchase uh, tickets for the online event of this. So Malayle Baptist have opened up their church, and our friend Chris Banks, who was the uh, member he led the evangelism team here, he's now pastor down there. So they've said if any of the ladies want to go and see that event, they can go along to Malayle Baptist on the 14th of October. And it's uh, doors open at 930 and the first session is at 10 and thankfully my prescription's holding up because I can see that up there all right but uh, they are providing um, food and refreshments as well and the even better news is it's free of charge but if you do intend to go ladies you need to let us know so if you let me know and I can pass the word along to to Chris uh, just to give them an indication if you'd like to come to that and if you aren't able to make that There's also a Baptist women's um, event called Prayer, Praise and Promises with Courtney Reisig. And it's taking place, it's an online um, event, taking place on Thursday 9th of October on Zoom. Now the thing is, sometimes in previous years we have been able to to host this at at the church as well. Um, But if that's something that some of the ladies are interested in and would like to do, 
you need to let me know because I need to get that set up if that's something you want to happen. Um, but before, we've ha opened up the, the little room at the back there before, and a number of our ladies have come down and uh, attended some of those online events. So if you'd like to do that, please do let us know. Okay, so that's Thursday, the 19th of October, but I'll be giving you a wee reminder about that, um, God will, next week as well too. So uh, these are all the announcements. You know, it's, do pray for all these different events coming up. And it is uh, good that we can have these opportunities um, even to be, to be fed as well, isn't it? And, uh, but our next hymn night today, before we turn to God's word, it reminds us of how God showed his mercy for us, the refuge he provided, and also of the benefits that we have obtained through our salvation in Christ. This is beneath the cross of Jesus. And we'll st just stay seated as we sing this together, please. Well, let's turn to the book of Genesis. We're going to um, uh, return to this series. We took a short break from that last week with our harvest service, but I want to turn to Genesis 7 today. Um, when we were last in Genesis, we met Noah, a man who the writer tells us was righteous and blameless in his generation, a man who walked with God. And it uses that, when it uses that phrase, blameless in his generation, it didn't mean Noah was a perfect man, as we'll see in a few weeks' time, but he was a man whose life stood in sharp contrast to that of the generation around him. And that generation was corrupted. Every intention, it says, of their heart was only evil continually. And so as the Lord saw the sin upon the earth, it grieved him. He announced he was going to bring judgment upon the earth. And that was something he told Noah. And he told Noah and commanded him to build an ark to house him, his family, and also a remnant of the animals upon the earth. But we looked also at some of the questions surrounding the ark. For example, how could it have, have housed all those animals? And you can look at that message in Genesis 6 uh, just to, uh, to, to, to hear those. 
But also we, we talked about what it might have been like as well too and what these measurements ended up the structure would have looked like. So uh, we'll maybe put up a picture about that in a little while when we turn to this passage later. But we last left Noah working on the ark. But today we reach a point when the day of judgment was at hand. Genesis 7, let's read it together. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive in the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground." And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean. And of birds and of everything that creeps in the ground. Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day Noah and his sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds. And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. And they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. The flood continued forty days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. The waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, and all swarming creatures that swarm in the earth and all mankind. Everything on the dry land, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. And we'll end our reading there at the verse 24, knowing that the Lord will bless his reading together. This is a passage about Noah finding refuge. And so let us sing of the refuge that we have as we sing Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. We'll stand as we sing this together, please.
Well, before we turn to God's word, once again, um, we're going to remember some things in prayer. Some of you may remember Pastor Ronnie Gibson. And when I say Ronnie Gibson, that's, I'm not talking about Alfie's brother, no. But Pastor Ronnie Gibson was a student assistant here during Pastor Garrett's time. And I know we spoke in the church here many times um, since then. Um, but uh, we got word that um, Pastor Ronnie Gibson passed away on Friday. And uh, his funeral is actually taking place today. So Alfie's gone to the funeral service in Kilkeel um, just to represent the, the church today. So do pray for uh, Ronnie's family. And I uh, also heard as well that Maureen Henry, um, Pastor Jim Henry's wife, also passed away. So we'll remember that family um, as well too. So let's, let's pray together and remember them particularly. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you are the God of all comfort, the one who is near to us, Lord, even when we, when we do suffer, when we go through difficult times. And Lord, we do pray for just a number of families, Lord, who are grieving today. Lord, we pray that they will know of your nearness to them, that they will know of your your strength, and of your help. Lord, we do pray for um, Pastor Gibson's family, Lord. We pray for them as they attend the funeral service later on today. And Father, we pray also um, for the one who takes that service. And Father, we pray, Lord, that they would know of your, your help even in, as they proclaim your word, as they tell of, of Ronnie's life and uh, testimony. Father, we pray that you would help them to proclaim the blessed hope that there is in Christ Jesus. We do also pray, Lord, for just the comfort, uh, pray for comfort, Lord, to be given to um, Pastor Henry's family as well and the death of his wife. Lord, we pray that uh, you will be near to them at this time. Lord, we pray that you would minister unto them. And Lord, we do you want to thank you for the blessed hope that we can have in Christ Jesus. That, Father, those who, who turn to you for refuge can know of your promised rest. And, Lord, just help and sustain the families, Lord, with that knowledge. Lord, we do also pray for um, our own members of our church, Lord, even who are housebound. For those, Lord, who would love to be here but are unable to just to, due to health matters at the moment. Lord, be near to them, uphold them, and encourage them even as they listen to the messages. Father, encourage them with visits and uh, even the phone calls that they would receive. May they know that your people, Lord, continually remember them in prayer. Lord, help them. Lord, even strengthen them spiritually. Be ever near to them. And Lord, we also pray that we would know of your presence here with us today. And Lord, we as we uh, look forward even as a, a church to some of these uh, events coming up in the next few weeks, Lord, we just pray for help even for Malayal Baptist as well. Uh, help them as they prepare to host the Women's Convention. And even, Lord, we pray for Gail Curry as uh, she organizes this uh, online event. And we pray just that all will come together even for the technology for that as well too. But Lord, we also pray for ourselves now as we turn to your word, as we look to be fed from that word. And so, Lord, speak to us now, minister to us, and even challenge and encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's turn back to Genesis 7, please. <coughs> Since the very end of chapter 6, in the break between chapter 6 and chapter 7, Many years have actually passed. We don't, the text maybe doesn't give us that clear indication of it, but you know, the writer just simply says of how Noah uh, was given that command to build the ark, and then in chapter 7, 
the ark has been built. But remember how many years have actually gone past here. There's been 120 years, 120 years when Noah was building this massive structure of the ark. And we're not exactly told of what, how, what transpired during all those years of him building that ark. Clearly, Noah would have had to deal with a lot. Can you imagine it being given that command and being given the measurements of it? And you'd be thinking to yourself, hold on a minute, that's huge. I don't know about you, but you know, you maybe get stressed out at building a, a Billy bookcase from Ikea. I don't know, but could you imagine this massive construction project of an ark? What a daunting prospect. But yet Noah even proves himself to be that righteous man because he's seeking to obey what God told him. Uh, of course, Noah wouldn't have done that um, alone. Uh, clearly, he would have had help from his sons even in building that ark as well. And we don't know whether the text doesn't say, but maybe he, maybe he did actually employ others to, to help even with that ark as well too. Uh, you know, we, of course, ourselves as, individual, as individuals, we you know, might employ non-Christian contractors too. And, and maybe uh, this is what Noah did, but we don't know that. But we know that our, the building the ark was a huge prospect, but he had 120 years to do it. It was a large, we talked about how the structure was um, in the previous message in Genesis 6. It was a large kind of more barge-like structure as well. And it had three levels, the text tells us of that. And it was meant to be, you know, this large stable vessel. And, uh, you know, here... He were working. He was working on this, and it's not just. It wouldn't have been easy just because of even the the physical and manual labor involved. But consider how others would have treated Noah building the ark. I'm sure over those years there must have been much mockery of Noah. They'd be thinking, "What is he up to? Look at this. He's he's building this ark. He's he's talking about some flood coming. Where's the sign of it? They must have been. They maybe be thinking. I'm sure they laughed at Noah. They maybe thought he was a bit mad." Working on this for all these years. Maybe as the years went on. You know how it is sometimes if you hear of something um, on the news for say for months and, and years. Sometimes you just get so used that you just even, you know, kind of, you let it wash over you. And maybe that's how it was as the years went on with Noah. Maybe they just got simply used to, oh look, there he is again. He's building this ark. And maybe that's what it was like. But God had said it was coming. And Noah believed it. Noah was a man of faith. He acted in faith in building this ark. I'm sure it wasn't easy over those years. People no doubt mocked him just as many people mock Christians even for believing in the biblical account of the flood. But this is an actual event that happened. This was an actual event. It wasn't a myth. And we know that because Jesus believed it as well. Jesus talked about uh, as it was in the days of Noah as well. He taught about that as well. He used it as an illustration of his uh, judgment. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. He wasn't the only one. Peter did as well. Peter also in uh, I think it's 2 Peter 3. Talks about um, of how Noah even uh, proclaimed to the people. Was a herald of righteousness. So these people believed it was real. You know, so should we. As we mentioned before, there's even other accounts in ancient literature outside of Scripture as well, which also talk about a flood, a global flood. There's other accounts that talk about that. And why would someone do that if it didn't actually happen? See, this account is a reality. It's something that we can believe. And unlike some of those other accounts, even the measurements of the ark do account for being actually something that was realistic. One of the other ancient accounts talks about a, a, a structure to, you know, to house people from a flood. Only it talks about a cube. And as we talked about before, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't fancy traveling on one of those because it wouldn't have been too stable. But this structure, yes, clearly would have been due to its measurements as well, a large barge-like structure. But our chapter begins here with an announcement from God. The construction work was completed. And maybe, maybe we don't know it. It maybe it had been completed for, for some time. And maybe no one was wondering when, when's the moment. He might have been waiting about. And then God sends him a command. He gives him a command. This is a command to be ready. 
It's time to make final preparations. Now is the moment. His judgment is coming. The Lord tells him, go into the ark along with your family. And once more we're reminded why Noah found favor with God. Because he says, I've seen you are righteous before me in this generation. And as I mentioned a few weeks ago, this isn't saying, it's not saying that it's because of Noah's works that he was saved. It's not saying that. Hebrews 11 makes that clear to us. Noah was saved because of his faith. He was saved because of his faith in God's promise. But his character and his life stood in sharp contrast from those around him. He was righteous before God and his generation, unlike all the rest of that generation. The rest had turned from God, whereas Noah had trusted in God. He lived his life with that uh, in reverence of God. We see that in how he has obedience as well too. But then the Lord gives Noah more detailed instruction of the animals he's to bring into the ark. He's told to take seven pairs of clean animals, male and female, and a pair of each unclean animal. And also seven pairs of the birds of the heavens, male and female. Now, last Sunday night, if you were here, we're doing a series on Acts on Sunday night. And we were talking about the story of Peter and the vision he was given. We talked a little bit about what was a clean and an unclean animal um, in the Jewish law. But you see there's a distinction made between these. And um, if you're writing notes, look, uh, sorry, Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11 tells you what these unclean and clean animals were, or Deuteronomy 14. But why was there a distinction made in terms of the number of animals? Why were they to bring seven of the clean ones and not of the unclean? Well, the clean animals were those that were approved for the people to eat, but also for sacrifice as well. Those are the ones to be sacrificed as well. So that's why there's more pairs of the the clean animals. And of course, they were going to bring other supplies on the ark uh, as well too, um, you know, as well. But it was saying that these were the animals that were going to be used for sacrifice as well too. And we know of the importance of that after they came out of the ark. The importance of the number of birds as well is going to become uh, significant as well too for that reason. But the Lord says to Noah, he's to take these animals inside because in seven days there's going to be rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, the Lord reminds Noah, this is not some small rain shower. This is going to blot out every living thing from the earth. You know, 40 days and 40 nights. The number 40 is actually a really significant number in the Old Testament. God often uses uh, periods of 40 to speak of times of testing or even periods of judgment as well. So think about the life of Moses. Uh, It was split up into really 40-year periods. Uh, So he had uh, 40 years uh, uh, in the palace. He had 40 years in the wilderness. You know, so basically, um, and Israel, of course, spent 40 years in that wilderness. Also, the Philistines oppressed Israel how many years? 40 years. We find that number coming up again and again. It speaks of periods of time, of testing, or also of periods of judgment. So you might wonder, though, why then the seven days warning? There was a lot to organize, wasn't there, in those seven days? When the Lord told Noah to get everything ready, Well, there was going to be a complicated process to to board even that ark and to board the inhabitants. Now, this summer, uh, the end of the summer there, when we when we got our ferry, it took it took half an hour to board then. But you know, these people on board, even seeing that process, you realise that actually it took a lot more time than that because while we were sitting waiting. Uh, there was also other, you know, supply trucks were going on as well. They had these things, and of course they were going on in big lorries, and they had all these many, many workers helping them load and unload. Noah didn't have that, did he? He didn't have um, as many as that. But he had, uh, this was a long process for him boarding this boat. He hadn't any cars to, to go on to help him with that. And, you know, as well, this was going to take a lot of organization. Think about it. I don't know about you, whether you're the sort of person, whenever you go on a journey, how quick you can be ready for it. Some people are really good at that. Emma's usually better, that more, Emma's more the last minute packer. I'm, I'm more the one who has it packed the, last, you know, the day before, at least more than 24 hours, I could tell you, you know, what I'm going to do. But here's the thing. Noah had all this time of, of preparation. I'm probably going to get in trouble for home for that one. But 
Noah had all this time of preparation. Why? The seven days were going to be a complicated process. He was going to have to load on all the, the food, not just for himself, the food for the animals as well. He was going to have to load all that, get all that ready in the ark. That was a big operation. That's more than the, the Stana Sea Line. The Stana Sea Line had to you know, board for much more. All food to get ready for these, this number of, of, of days they're going to be in the ark. 40 days, 40 nights, from the 150 days, it says, actually, as well, there too. You know, they were going to have to get the food. They were going to maybe need other things. What about the other side, whenever the, the floods have subsided? Maybe they'd want to bring tools or something as well. Maybe they'd want to get all those things ready. They would have other things that they wanted to bring. There was maybe some possessions from his family. Then he would have to load the animals as well. It's a complicated process sometimes even to get try and get two of us ready for a holiday. Never mind getting a whole, never mind getting a whole, uh, you know, crowd of people uh, ready on a three-level barge. Three-level barge with all these probably different compartments for the animals. Noah was going to have to go, right, this, I'm going to put them there. Mm, maybe I don't want to put those ones beside that. I'm going to have to maybe, he needed the seven days, let me tell you, to get all this. But what a flurry of activity. Could you imagine if you would have been looking on and seeing all this? You'd be thinking, what's he doing now? There he's built this thing. What's happening? And then, but imagine the scene of the animals being brought to Noah. Noah didn't have to go on a safari. It was God was going to bring them. God was going to bring them to him as well. You see, but building this ark, think about it, was also a witness. See, the open door as the animals made their way in was still a moment of opportunity, still a reminder of God's grace. The fact that they seen of that open door. But yet many of them were, the generation were so hardened in their sin. All they could do was they maybe got so used to seeing this big ark sitting there. Even when they seen the animals in, they thought, they maybe thought to themselves, no, it's going to be stuck in there for a while, and sure nothing's going to happen. They just maybe just laughed it off. Even while the door was open, it was a little bit of a reminder of God's grace. And this is a bit like the age we're living in today, because it is an age of God's grace as well. Because God is told that Christ is coming back for his own. He's told us that there's going to be also a terrible day of judgment as well. And that's a day that will bring separation. A day where the sinner will be cast out forever from God's presence and will spend eternity in hell. But that day is not yet. There's still time to listen to the warning. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul wrote, writes, Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that can be a day of salvation if for people who will listen to that warning. And will accept the invitation to find refuge in the one God has provided. That open door was witness to the people of that. The door was still open. But that door was not going to be open forever. See Noah was one who did all that God had said. And then a week later God's judgment came again. Just as God had said. Because what we see is we see also of Noah's obedience. And God's refuge as well too. I'm sure there was a period when all the animals had been loaded on the ark. And maybe he and his family were were waiting inside. Although the way the text worded it, it sounds almost like, you know, as they were loading them on, as they'd finished loading, you know, the family had come on when actually the rain had started to fall. Had just started. But imagine the rest of the people must have been making jokes and laughing. Now, the writer tells us that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. Now, why are we told his age? Well, in chapter 8, he's going to refer to his age again to give us an indication of how long actually Noah was in the ark. But, uh, and we dealt, let me mention this briefly, if you weren't there at the rest of uh, their messages when we talked about the ages, uh, why did people live uh, so long in those days? Uh, well, just to refresh our memory, you know, the earth was certainly a lot different in those days than it is now. The climate was certainly a lot better in those days than it was now. There was no pollution, um, of course, then, the way there is today. Also, the impact of sin and disease was, was still just 
being felt on the, the generations. Uh, as the, but as the generations went on, the impact of sin and disease only increased of course. So that's why even, you know, uh, lifetimes are are not the way they are. But also it was evidence of God's grace, those long lifetimes, in order that the people would have those families and that they would multiply and fill the earth. That was further reason even for those uh, long uh, lifetimes in those years. But as they were in the ark, as the rain begins to come down, Noah enters the ark along with his wife, his children, and their wives too. And notice it doesn't say Noah forced them onto the ark. No, it doesn't say dragged them onto the ark. They came. They too clearly believed God's word. And as those rains started to, to fall, clearly they did believe it. Maybe there were some even up to the last minute from the other generation to the generations. Maybe as they saw the rain falling, maybe they still even thought to themselves, maybe this is just another rain shower. But our text shows us this wasn't any ordinary rain shower. It wasn't any ordinary rain shower because God was providing a way of salvation for Noah, his family, and the animals too that would be preserved. But you know what reminds us that God provides a way of salvation for us too. He sent Jesus to be our refuge. Jesus is our refuge from the coming judgment. This judgment which will fall upon all, both the living and the dead. Jesus, he sent Jesus to earth to live that perfect, sinless life in order that he could be the perfect offering for our sin. He was the one who could who would give of himself, who would be the offering for our sins, so that the wrath of God would be poured out on him for our sakes. He is our refuge from the time of judgment. And so when God's judgment comes, what we see is this was no ordinary rain shower. Verses 11 to 24, notice how it describes of this. But notice also, before we we come to what this flood was actually like, notice it tells us the date. Why would it do that? Out of all the things I've been told so far, there's a lot of emphasis on the ages and things like that, but it actually tells us the day that the flood came. It's reminding us that this is an actual event. It took place on an actual day. That's when it began. Here's when the flood began. And I wonder as it how it began that morning. Maybe it was just maybe it started off like any other morning. Maybe there was no initial sign of, of panic from the people. Maybe the people just had been laughing at the flurry of activity in the ark. But either way, it seems people were going about their regular activities. And why do I say that? Because when Jesus talks about the judgment that came on the earth, he refers to these exact events. In Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, he talks about the second coming. He talks about the time when he will come again. And he says of that day, no one knows that day or hour, only the Father alone. But it says, so it will be as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. And he says in Matthew 24, uh, verse 37 to 39, on that day they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Now what, what's that mean? Why is it telling us that? Well, it's simply saying the people were just going about their daily lives. They were going about their daily lives and seemingly unaware or ignorant of what would come. And then... The flood came upon them. On that day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and swept them, the rest of them away. But Christ used that to speak of his coming. And he is coming again. He's coming for his people. He's also coming to the judge upon the earth as well. And of that day, this world does, does not know. We see plenty of uh, things, plenty of signs in that, even around the, the world uh, today. Even some of the things that are taking place in our news, it reminds us that, you know, that day is drawing ever nearer as well. And that's why we must be ready. We must be ready for that day. But on that day when the rain fell, verse 11, it says it was like the windows of heaven had opened. The flood didn't just come from the skies as well, but it came from the depths. It actually came from the depths. It says fountains of the great deep burst forth. Maybe there was a huge outflow of pressure from uh, some underground source that had even burst up on the earth. It seems that below the earth there were some sources of water as well and it burst up. So the rain wasn't just coming down. 
It was coming up as well too. The floods were coming everywhere. See, so great was this flood, but so great was the wickedness upon the earth. And now the waters of judgment were coming to destroy. You know, we perhaps see floods and tsunamis on on TV, but this is nothing compared to what we read about here. This was a global event. And not only that, it had a greater, not only had it a greater scope, but it had greater destruction. It was going to cover even the very mountains. It would continue for 40 days and 40 nights. While, meanwhile, while Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives were on the ark along with the animals. The Lord had given them refuge. And notice something else. The Lord had shut them in. See, the door reminds us of the wonderful security that the believer has in God's refuge in Christ. We are sealed. The Lord sealed the door. And so, for the believer, we have a refuge in Jesus. You know, though the flood would rage and the rain would pour, nothing was going to harm those who God had shut in. And the same is true for the believer. It doesn't mean we won't face difficulties. It doesn't mean we won't face trials in this life. But we know that nothing ultimately can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Such is the security that the believer has. You know, on that day of judgment, when that day comes, the believer knows that our sins have been forgiven. Not because of our merits, but because of what Jesus has done. On that day, the believer knows that God sustains and keeps us, even until we get to glory. The Lord sustains and keeps us till that day. The work that he has begun in our hearts, he's going to complete on that day. He will complete it. He'll hold us fast. See, this passage is a sober warning also to those who do not believe, to those who maybe mock the Christian, or, or um, maybe even it's a warning also for the indifferent. Because I'm sure there were plenty who were kind of a bit indifferent, who just got used to seeing what Noah was doing, and it just kind of let it wash over them. Maybe they're thinking, you know, that's okay for him, but, you know, it's not for me. Don't you hear the same thing today from a lot of people? That's okay for you. It's not for me. You know, whether people choose to ignore it or not, God's judgment is still coming. And so this passage is a warning, an important reminder that God's moment of opportunity, that God's day of grace will not last forever. As Philip Evison remarks in his commentary, he says, for those inside the closed entrance, it meant their salvation. But for those outside the closed entrance meant their destruction. That moment of opportunity did close. It closed just as God said. See, God is a gracious God and he is long-suffering. He doesn't delight in judgment. He gives people opportunity to repent. Now, maybe you're watching and listening to this and you're not a Christian and, and maybe you've had multiple opportunities. Maybe you've heard the message as a child from Sunday school or some other kids club or you maybe heard of Jesus. You maybe even read about Jesus or, or know of other Christians too. But yet you still haven't taken that step of faith yet. What's holding you back? This is a moment of opportunity. This is a moment of opportunity now, even hearing this message. But when you take it. See, James Montgomery Boyce says of this passage, the same God who opens doors, just as he opened the ark, he's the same God who is also the door. And he is the one who also closes the door. And refuses to open them when the time of grace has passed. See Jesus told this story to illustrate this very same point. Um, In Matthew's gospel chapter 25. Jesus told a very well known story about ten virgins. Ten bridesmaids who were going to a wedding. Five of them were wise. They had their lamps trimmed and full of oil. Ready for the, the bridegroom to come. And they would join that wedding procession. But five were foolish. Five hadn't prepared. And so all all ten had fallen asleep. And the moment came when the bridegroom came, but those foolish virgins weren't prepared. Instead, they rushed off to buy oil. But those who were ready joined the procession and entered into the marriage feast. And they enjoyed all that entailed. But for the others, they left it too late. They left it too late. When they arrived, Jesus says, the door was shut. And as they tried to plead, they were refused. 
Because the voice said, truly I say to you, I don't know you. There will come a day where everyone will stand before God. And on that day, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late for someone to turn around and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, or I didn't realize, or I should have listened. On that day, there'd be no excuse. You know, Jesus told that parable because he wanted people to be ready for the hour of his coming. But as we close, are we prepared for that day? See, the only way we can be ready is if we trust the refuge God provided. If we trust the way of salvation. That's the only way Noah was saved. By trusting in God's word. By trusting in that refuge. By going in. Taking that step inside the refuge. But so the only way that people can be saved today is by taking that step of faith and seeking refuge in Jesus. See, there's no other way. There was only one door in the ark and there is only one way to God. It's not through church attendance. It's not through doing good things to other people, not through any good works. The only way that we can know that refuge for sure is if we've trusted in Jesus, if we've turned from our sin and trusted in him. This is still a day of opportunity. The door is still open. We don't know for how long. For those of us who are Christians, we, we don't know. Only the Lord alone knows. And that's why we need to keep sharing the gospel. That's why we need to keep telling of others. That's why we need to keep praying and not give up. Keep praying that lives would be changed that people would come to Christ and that they would seek the one who is the open door. Praise God for his mercy and grace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Your mercy that moved in our hearts to take that step of faith. And Father, there still is the day of grace, the day of opportunity. Father, for Christ has not yet come, but Father, we have to be ready for that day. Others have to be ready for that day. Lord, help us as we continue to sow the seed of the gospel, as we do that as a church in various ways. Lord, help us with that. As individuals, Lord, we do pray for those unsaved friends and family members even who are so concerned about Lord, soften their hearts. As they go about their daily lives, Lord, may they not be like it was in the days of Noah. May they be challenged, Lord, about the reality of not just their physical security, but their eternal security. May they know that that refuge can only be found in Jesus. So, Lord, continue to speak. Continue to speak through our lives. And, Lord, give us opportunities even to witness for you. Lord, we want to give you thanks. Lord, that when the Savior comes, for those of us here in Christ Jesus, we can say, Lord, when that role is called up yonder, Lord, we'll be there. And so, Lord, help us as we sing of that glorious truth now and as we remember the Lord around the table in his own appointed way, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing of that um, hymn we just referred to there. That when the role is called up yonder, if you have had faith and trust in Jesus, we can know with assurance that we'll be there. Let's stand as we sing this, please.
want to turn to a chapter as I've been in the book of Genesis. A number of times I've come back to this chapter and you might guess what one we're going to. Romans chapter 5. Because there's so many parallels with sometimes what you see going on in, in Genesis and also what we read of here in Romans. But as we've come to Romans 5, we've looked at different verses in this. And so I want to read verses 9 to 10 of this chapter. See, this morning we saw how God and his family were, or sorry, how Noah and his family, God was going to save them from his judgment by the way of salvation, by the refuge that he provided. But as we gather around the table, we also remember and give thanks for the refuge that we have in Christ Jesus, the way of salvation God provided for us. So let's read just verses 9 to 10 of this. Since therefore we have been now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we should be saved by his life. See, here is our hope. Here is our refuge in the judgment that's to come. We know when we stand before the Lord, we know that in Christ, our life is hidden with him. We have this wonderful assurance, you see, of what the verdict will be for those who trust in Christ. Because as Paul tells us here, we've been justified by his blood, declared righteous because of our faith in Christ and his atoning sacrifice. We know that he himself gave, gave of himself for our sins. And so we trust in him. And so Paul says, because of that fact, we have this wonderful assurance on that day that we will be saved from the wrath of God. Christ bore the, the wrath that we as sinners deserved. The full weight of God's wrath for the sin of mankind. Think of all the sin that you have committed in your life. Now multiply that by each person in our world today. Now multiply that again by each generation that has come and gone. So great was the weight of our sin. And so great was the wrath poured upon our Savior as he hung upon the cross. But so great was the grace of God that he would even provide this way of salvation that people who were once sinners, once, as Paul says here, even enemies of God, could be forgiven. And now we give thanks, for we are, as Paul says here in verse 10, reconciled, reconciled to God. The gulf of separation that our sins once brought between us and the holy God, he's brought us near by the death of his son. He did this through faith, through faith in Christ's sacrifice through the cleansing of our sin, through removing the guilt and condemnation that was once ours. Who could have dreamt that a Roman cross, the one of, one of the most horrible, the, the worst and most horrifying devices of punishment and torture ever imagined, yet as Paul says in verse 8, it could become a symbol for the great love with which he's shown us. This is how God showed his love towards us that Christ gave of himself on the cross. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're reconciled not just by his death, but lastly also by his life. Because our Savior didn't stay in the tomb. He rose again, and both are vital parts of the gospel message. Because he lives, the Savior keeps us even by his power. And so today, as we sit around this table, we, we sit as forgiven sinners. Forgiven in Christ Jesus. Sinners saved by God's grace. We come around this table not because of our merit, but because of what Jesus has done for us and because of our faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice. People who, like Noah, we know of God's provision. We too know of God's grace. We too can speak and sing of his security. And so let us respond with thanksgiving as these emblems remind us of the refuge which God has provided us through Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus on the night and when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Our Heavenly Father, we again come into your presence, Lord, to give you thanks for this God and your Lord's table. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice, your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, done for us, Lord, at Calvary's cross. Lord, we anticipate now to take this emblem in remembrance of his scourged body, Lord, and the suffering he shed for sinners such as us, Lord. We give you humble thanks, Lord. We give you thanks. And we all say, Amen. Heavenly Father, we just take this time to think and to remember the love that you showed on the cross of Calvary when you gave your life-saving blood as a token of your love to us and a guarantee that one day, through that blood, we will receive eternal life. So, Lord, as we take this emblem Help us to remember your love on Calvary for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the refuge that you have given us in Christ Jesus. That he came to be the way. That he still is the way that sinners can come to you. Father, we want to give you thanks for your grace. Grace grace which you have shown us. but, But Father, grace which you continue to extend to others today. But Father, we know that time of grace will not go on forever. So, Lord, we do pray for those that who don't yet know you, that they will see the open door, that they will listen to the warnings. Father, maybe even you've been speaking into their lives in various ways, maybe even through Christian friends, family members, or other circumstances. But, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would soften their hearts and that they would come to you. Father, help us once again as we would gather in this evening to meet around your word once more as we consider how the good news of the gospel was proclaimed to a Gentile man called Cornelius. Lord, help us as we consider your word. Encourage us by it and encourage us even for our meeting together and once more as we meet with you. Lord, take us now to our homes in safety. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.